You can describe Meteora in many ways. Magical, extraordinary, breathtaking, impressive. But whichever adjective you use, there's no doubt that it's also unique. Quite rightly, an absolute must-see on the itinerary of over three quarters of a million visitors every year. If you're one of those visitors, then this video will give you information about Meteora and provide you with some useful information to help you plan your visit. The monasteries of Meteora are built on a collection of rock formations which have been carved by wind and rain eroding the land over millions of years, resulting in pillars of varying heights and widths. They are high, sheer and forbidding rocks, the tallest of which rises more than 700 metres. As you approach Meteora, the sight of the monasteries clinging precariously to the tops of the rock pillars is both fascinating and breathtaking, and you will find yourself wondering just how the monks ever managed to create these beautiful sanctuaries. Well, that story starts over a thousand years ago. Evidence shows us that religious occupation of the site began around 1000 AD, with a few hermit settlements and the first recorded small buildings appearing in the 11th century. However, the first organised monastic community emerged when a monk named Athanasius founded the Monastery of Great Materion in 1356. Athanasius was born in Patras in 1302 to a prominent and wealthy family. He was baptised Andronicus. His father died when Andronicus was just a child and he was brought up by an uncle. When Andronicus was a young man, the Catalans occupied Patras, so he travelled to Thessaloniki with his uncle, and then, when the uncle died, he went to the monastery on Mount Athos. The monks wouldn't allow him to stay on Mount Athos, as he was still very young and couldn't grow a beard. It's true, take your time and think about the reason for that. So he next went to Constantinople, where he met Gregory of Sinai, among others, who initiated him into the way of asceticism. After some more extensive travelling, he spent a few years on Crete, staying until he reached his 30s. And then, sometime after his 30th year, and now with a fully grown beard, he returned to Mount Athos, where he was accepted as a novice monk. He quickly distinguished himself, completed his training, and it was on Mount Athos, upon receiving the great schema, that he adopted his monastic name of Athanasius. Feeling under threat of religious persecution from the invading Ottomans, Athanasius left Mount Athos with two other monks and ended up in Kalabaka, where the three of them settled on a rock and organised the building of a church, which they hoped, because of its isolation, would be safe from the Turks. They named the rock Meteoron. Athanasius' reputation as a wise and holy monk spread far and wide, and many other ascetic monks came to help him build a monastery, which he dedicated to the transfiguration of Jesus Christ, and the monastery became the Great Meteoron. In the monastery, Athanasius and his followers devoted their lives to Christ, and to teaching the younger brothers of the monastery. Athanasius died on the 20th of April 1380, at the age of 78, and he is now considered a saint in the Orthodox Church. Also, in the second half of the 14th century, to escape further persecution by the Ottomans, who had now fully occupied Greece, other monks arrived and started to build more monasteries at the very top of the rock pillars. The only access to these monasteries was by removable ladders which could be pulled up behind the monks. The monks also constructed winch and pulley systems, which were used to haul up nets and baskets of supplies. But of course it wasn't long before the baskets were adapted and used to raise people as well. And this method of access continued for centuries. Thankfully for visitors today, steps were cut into the rocks during the 1920s. This group of monasteries eventually became and remains the second largest in Greece after Mount Athos. The monastic life there flourished, reaching its peak during the 15th and 16th centuries when there were 24 active monasteries. Today most of the buildings are in ruins with only six still inhabited. These are the Great Materion, Valum, Agia Triada, Rusano, which is occupied by nuns, the small Ios Nicolaios, and Ios Stephen, which is also occupied by nuns and is the only one of the six that can be reached without climbing some steps. The complex of six monasteries not only maintains and preserves the buildings, but also importantly provides us with a rare example of how monastic organisation existed between the 14th and 16th centuries, even though fewer than 60 monks and nuns continue to live there now. The monasteries are open to the public for a very small entrance fee at each one. Visitors are asked to dress respectfully, which basically means long trousers for men, no shorts, long skirts, no trousers for women, with long sleeves for both men and women. You're allowed to take pictures outside of the buildings, but photography is not permitted inside. Once you are inside, however, you will find small museums, chapels, wonderful frescoes painted on the walls, early printed books and illuminated manuscripts. 
beautifully tended gardens, and, of course, some very magnificent views. There are also some daunting entrance platforms where you can witness the precarious access method used by previous occupants and visitors. And there are one or two surprises as well, but I won't spoil them as you'll enjoy them more when you discover them for yourself. However, one surprise that I will mention is that if you have the time, you should also seek out the Byzantine Church of the Assumption of the Virgin Mary in the old town of Calabarca. You can thank me later for that. If you want to visit all six monasteries, I think you should allow two days, not just because of the time required to physically visit each one, but also because the monasteries are not all open every day. So you'll need to plan ahead to avoid disappointment if there's a particular one you want to see and only have a single day. I've posted both summer and winter 2022 opening times for each of the six monasteries in the description below. So how do you get there? A good question, and of course the answer depends on where you start from. But as a useful guide, Meteora is a four hour drive drive from Athens, six hours by bus or four and a half hours by the single train that runs each day. From Thessaloniki it's just under three hours to drive or five hours by bus, there's no train service. And from Patras it's a three and a half hour drive, seven hours on the bus or you can do a combined bus and train journey changing at Lamia in about five hours. Clearly driving is probably the best way to get there, but be aware that parking can be a problem at the monasteries. So once you've secured a parking spot, it might be a good idea to leave the car there and take a taxi or a local bus to the monasteries. There are hotels and restaurants in Calabaca, but it does get very busy in the tourist season. Remember that more than three quarters of a million tourists visit Meteoria each year, mostly between May and September, which obviously leads to overcrowding. So it's advisable to book your accommodation in advance. Similarly, the restaurants are very busy in season, and so much so that many of the locals go to nearby Kastraki to eat. In 1988, Meteora was recognized for its outstanding value as a UNESCO World Heritage Site one of 18 in Greece. Its site reference is 455 and there's a link to the UNESCO information in the details below. Check out the other useful links in the description too. Well I hope you found this video useful and I'll be producing more like it in the future so you may want to consider subscribing to see other information videos about Greece. Finally if you can add any further useful information to this video please comment below so that others will know.